the chant on goodwill with which we end the chant every evening starts out, may I be happy. It's so simple and so basic, and yet we have so many conflicted feelings about that desire. Sometimes we even feel guilty for having the desire. But when you think about it, that's the main aim of people through life, is to find happiness, and especially to find a happiness that doesn't let them down, doesn't disappoint them, doesn't turn into something else. And considering the importance of how much effort we put into happiness, you'd think that we'd really be observant and disciplined and be very intelligent about how we go about it. And yet, when you look at the way most people live, that's not the case at all. It's all very hit or miss. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. A large problem is because we're not willing to set priorities in our lives. What's really important and what's not quite so important. A story I've, some of you have heard before. A friend of mine who wrote a novel in which a young woman in China suddenly has a very unwelcome stepmother. The stepmother's not a bad person, it's just that the young woman was so upset at her mother's death and had believed her father when he said that he would never marry again, and all of a sudden he brings his courtesan home as a wife. But the courtesan's an intelligent person, and she sets about to try to win the young girl over. So one night while they're playing chess, she tries to teach her what she feels is the most important lesson in life. That is, you have to decide that there's one thing you want more than anything else, and you're willing to sacrifice everything else for that one thing. And the girl's kind of half listening, half not listening, as they're playing chess, and begins to notice that her stepmother's losing pieces all over the place. She starts getting more aggressive. Ah, oh, her stepmother is a bad chess player. Well, it doesn't take long before the, chess, the stepmother actually wins. Checkmate. Because she had been willing to lose her pieces. Trimmed down her army so that it was a good fighting machine there on the chessboard. My friend, the, the novelist, is also a professor at a university, and she, every time she publishes a novel, she has to go around to the different alumni clubs and read passages from her novel. And in this particular novel, this was the only self-contained passage that you could read, and there was kind of a dramatic unity to the passage in 15, 20 minutes. But she found after a while that nobody wanted to hear the lesson. She had to fall all over herself to explain, well, the, the girl learned many other lessons in the novel as well. But she finally got so she had to stop reading the passage to people. Nobody liked the message. We want to win and keep all our chess pieces. That's why we lack intelligence in our pursuit of happiness. One of the basic principles in the Buddhist teachings, if you see that there's a higher or more true form of happiness you have to be willing that you can gain by giving up a lower form of happiness, well, you have to give up the lower form. Be willing to be happy to give it up. That's what's hard about the practice. Because the Buddha is so single-minded in his pursuit of true happiness that he you look at his own life story, he was willing to give up family, power, all kinds of stuff, just because there was this one possibility that there might be a happiness that didn't change, that wasn't subject to aging, illness, and death. That was deathless itself. And he threw everything else away, and the, the stories they tell about how all of his friends tried to reason with him, how his Everybody in the family tried to reason with us, saying, this is ridiculous, and you know, be content with the pleasures that ordinary human beings are content with. But basically, his basic response was, well, look at what happens to ordinary human beings. They age, grow ill, and die. And they have to get separated from all the things they love. And what do they have then if they haven't found anything of more lasting value within? And so he went out to pursue that single-minded goal. And the story tells us he found it. And so it's this possibility that, as he said, it wasn't just because he, of any special powers of his own, but there were powers that anybody could develop in his or her mind, if you were resolute and determined enough. So there is this possibility, and we owe it to ourselves to explore it, that there's a happiness that doesn't change, there's a happiness that we can attain that doesn't change.
through developing our powers of mind. It requires discipline, it requires mindfulness. But the path itself is not all difficult, because you look at the Buddha asks us to take suffering and stress as our first noble truth. In other words, the first thing we really pay attention to, to understand it. Not because he's gloomy or pessimistic, but he's just realistic. This is the way most pleasures end up. The things you cling to, no matter how much how nice they may be, then when they change into something else, there's going to be suffering. So he takes the side of life that we don't like to look at, and he basically rubs our nose in it. Just look at this. Really try to understand it. The suffering that comes from clinging. Exactly how far does that word suffering go? How far does the stress go? The reason he does that, he says you learn an awful lot about the mind. But he also gives you tools for seeing it very clearly. After all, there are four noble truths, and the fourth noble truth is the path to practice, like we were chanting just now. And the essential factor in the path to practice, the Buddha says, the heart of it is right concentration. Get the mind to settle down, be really comfortable here in the present moment. So we not only do use suffering and pain and stress as a noble truth, but also there's a pleasure that comes from the centered mind. That's a noble truth as well. But in either case, the whole point is that you learn how to use these things. For most of us, suffering comes and we just try to push it away. Pleasure comes and we try to indulge in it. But the Buddha says, use them as tools to learn more, to go further. This pleasure that comes when the mind is still and at ease, can you develop it? This is what the concentration practice is for, working with the breath, trying to Keep the breath in mind, keep coming back so you get more and more familiar with it, so you begin to know more of its ins and outs. So that you can create the state of mind as really willing to look at the truth, because most of us live very in very fragmented minds, damaged minds, especially in modern society. In order to admit the truth about what we've been doing, first we have to heal a lot of those wounds, and that's a lot of what concentration practice does. As you settle down, there becomes a greater sense of fullness, wholeness, well-being. There's a sense of ease that you can tap into at any time, just by focusing on the breath, being on friendly terms with your breath, being on friendly terms with your body in the present moment, getting to know it really intimately. Once you have that sense of well-being, then you can really turn and look at this whole issue of suffering and stress, and not feel threatened by the questions. Because after all, the Buddha is saying, okay, look at what the mind is doing to cause that stress. Our normal reaction is to go out and blame it on somebody else or something outside. But he says the real cause is there in the mind. Now, if the mind is already feeling haggard and fragmented as it is, it's just not going to want to hear this. But once you start to deal with a sense of well-being and sense of wholeness that comes from getting the mind concentrated, getting it centered and focused here in the present in a comfortable way. It's a lot easier to admit the truths about what's going on and to look objectively at this problem of suffering and stress. The Buddha said our normal reaction to it is twofold. One is we're bewildered by it, because it seems to come out of nowhere and can come at any time. And the second is that we're searching for a way out. When there's a somebody who knows something about how to get beyond this suffering, that's our common reaction. So the first thing is there's bewilderment and there's a question, a search. The problem is that most of us, the way we question issues of suffering and pain, we don't frame the questions very well. We frame them out of ignorance. And so many times our questions, instead of helping us get beyond suffering and stress, actually compound the problem, lead us into more suffering, more stress. So to gain insight, the Buddha recommends a regimen of questions. In one of them, he says, it's just, just look at the, stress, the sensation of stress in and of itself and ask, okay, what else comes along with this? And in other words, instead of blaming yourself or blaming other people, just say, well, what else is there in the mind whenever there's suffering and stress? What seems to underlie it? So you drop the issue of it, who's at fault? 
not that you drop the issue of whether there's anybody there at all. You don't say that there isn't anyone. You don't say that there is. You just say, okay, what's it? look at the mind in terms of cause and effect. Use that problem of stress, that suffering, as a tool to dig a little bit deeper into your end of the mind. What else is going on in there? He says, well, look for the clinging. What kinds of clinging are there? Well, the big one is clinging to your sense of self. Why do you identify with that suffering and stress? Can you experience it without identifying with it, without saying that it's me or mine? Can you experience it without clinging? And what happens to the, the sensation? Say if there's a physical pain, what happens to that physical, your, your relationship to that physical pain if you can drop the sense of the me or the mine there? What happens if you drop the various labels you put on it? In other words, you look at the issue not in terms of who's at blame, but just, okay, what's going on here? Are there any patterns you can detect? When you start asking those questions, then he said, then you get on the right track to seeing that it's not necessary to cling to these things. It's not necessary to identify with them. Starting with the body on to feelings, mind states, the whole works, all the things that we usually tend to identify with. He says, if you can learn to experience them without identifying with them, see what happens. In this sense, the the meditation not so much reprogramming the mind, saying you've got to believe this, to believe that. And if you can make yourself believe something or make it yourself see these things in these terms, then you're going to be awakened. It's not that. He said, ask about this, ask this question, ask that question. It's more like a treasure hunt. Is there something valuable in here? You pick up this thing and look at it. Well, no, that's not really valuable. Put it aside. Is this worth holding on to? Well, you look it up, look at it, pick it up. No, that's not worth holding on to. You just go through everything you tend to hold on to until you finally get or able to get the mind in a state where it doesn't have to hold on to anything anymore. Anything anymore. It's the state of concentration and mindfulness you've got it into. It gives it a sense of well-being and a sense of strength so that you get more and more independent from the things that you used to feel you had to lean on. And then you realize you don't have to. And you realize that the mind is greatly freed as you learn how to let go. And ultimately, it's taking care of everything else. Then you turn around and learn how to pry loose your attachments to that state of concentration. You let things go in the proper order. Many people are afraid of getting attached to concentration as soon as the mind settles down a little bit, feels good, whoops, got to let that go. That aborts the whole path right there. You've got to have a strong sense of concentration, strong sense of ease that is both mindful and clear so you can see where the mind is being attached to the body, so you can see where it's being attached to mental states, where you can see where it's, there's this attachment to the concept of the mind itself. Start taking them apart. Okay, once you've taken everything else apart, then you take apart your attachment to the concentration. So basically what we're learning here is a, a skillful approach to the question of what is true happiness. And we discover as the mind gets strengthened, it finally arrives at a happiness that doesn't have to depend on anything. That's a happiness that doesn't change. That's the kind of happiness that doesn't let you down. And everyone who's attained that says there's nothing else in the world that can compare. No matter how difficult the practice is, no matter how many, how long it takes, how many false starts, all the problems that you have to deal with, once you finally get there, there's no regret whatsoever. It was worth all the sacrifices. So that's what happens when you take the issue of happiness, which we'd think everybody would take seriously, and then really take it seriously. Look into it. Be very systematic. Use all your powers of your intelligence to look at this question. And wherever you see that the issue, what it, the practice demands, okay, you're willing to meet its demands.
That's the kind of dedication, that's the kind of interest that the issue demands, that it requires. And it more than pays off. <laughs>